Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate you on your election to that position. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and the traditional owners of my electorate, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and I pay respect to elders past and present. Deputy Speaker, I have the honour of being sent here to represent the mighty federal electorate of Fremantle, the place where the Swan River or Derbal Yerrigan meets the Indian Ocean, in the land of the Wajak Noongar, the place known for thousands of years as Walila. I'm proud to say that I've been shaped by Fremantle, by its landscape and its culture, by its function as a place of industry and trade in the arts, a port city, a place of arrival whose multicultural diversity and cohesion has been hard won and is precious, a place that looks out into the world and welcomes people whether they come for a short or a long time with open arms, a place defined by the heat and by the sea. Deputy Speaker, representing Fremantle is a great responsibility. There's no role or task that I can imagine being more meaningful to me in this life. And I'm going to pour myself into this work at home in my electorate and here in this place. I relish the fact that this work spans the full range from helping a person who's come to you when every other door is closed to working in this place to shape national laws and policy. And I think one should always inform the other. If you're from WA, it's work that literally spans the continent, and I look forward to all of it. I hope I can understand that, undertake the task with energy, humility, dedication and good humour. My constituents in Frio and my children will let me know if I don't. While I'm brand new to this role, Speaker, it seems to me that our work in Parliament at best is about making difficult judgments. They are difficult because the problems they address are often wicked and the remedies they apply are scarce and imperfect. They're difficult because very few judgments will be free of impact, very few decisions in the public and national interest will leave everyone the same or better off. And if that's the threshold test for reform or even for budget repair, then we're not going to get much done. As a person of labour values, I believe our work is fundamentally about the custody and stewardship of the things we share, public health and education, public transport, fair and safe working conditions and our environment. And it's about forging change so that we share and participate more equally and responsibly in Australia now, more equally and responsibly between this and future generations and with our fellow women and men across the planet. Speaker, the Australian economy has just marked a quarter century without recession, and that is remarkable. But the real story of those years is not the quarter by quarter growth numbers, and we are not here simply to be brokers or bookkeepers in some marketplace, or to admin a system whose form is taken to be unchangeable and whose inequities and imbalances, even through a period of growth, have to be accepted as somehow reflecting the natural order. We are here to look hard at inequality and social exclusion, to look hard at injustice and environmental damage, and to do something about it with our touchstone being the circumstances of people who are trapped by severe disadvantage as we, as we seek to help those who stand furthest from the light. Speaker, I'm the 11th representative of Fremantle, a federation seat, and I follow in the footsteps of some relatively well-known former members. <laughs> Since the Second War, World War, they include John Curtin, Kim Beasley Senior, John Dawkins, Carmen Lawrence and Melissa Park. That's a tough lineup to follow. <laughs> I had the privilege of working with both Carmen and Melissa, and I'm grateful to have benefited from their guidance and friendship. I recognise and pay tribute to the standard they set as Labor representatives who held fast to the pursuit of social inclusion, social justice and humanitarian principle. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, when Carmen Lawrence gave her first speech in this place in 1994, she remarked on the centenary of universal suffrage. My daughters are here today, and I'm glad they're able to see a parliament, especially on this side, that is replete with women who are ready to make a contribution and take their place here on merit, because women have been ready to make their contribution on that basis for a long time. And that process is not finished. Let's remember there are still 72 seats in this place that have not yet been represented by a woman. 
Deputy Speaker, it was a privilege to work with Melissa, who is here today, especially as part of a Labor government that brought in the first set of major 21st century national reforms, including a national apology to the stolen generations and to the forgotten Australians, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, the National Broadband Network, an unprecedented network of national marine protected areas, and the enabling conditions that have stimulated a burgeoning renewable energy industry. Together, these acts of creation and many others represented a much needed step change in our social democracy. Each of those reforms is carrying us towards a fairer, more sustainable and more creative Australia. And in time, each shift will settle deeply within our social fabric so that it will be hard to imagine that it was ever different. That's what Labor does. Last week, I spoke with a young dad in Spearwood who said how much the NDIS NDIS meant in terms of supporting his son who has autism. I also attended an open day at Stewart Place, a centre for people who were in out-of-home care as children, and I presented them with an Australian flag that hung in this place on the 16th of November 2009, the day the Prime Minister said, from this day forward, it is my hope that you will be called the Remembered Australians. During the first week in Parliament, I was briefed on the rollout of the NBN over the next 12 months to 29,000 households in the heart of my electorate, covering areas like Kubalup, Cardinia, Hilton, Sampson, Hamilton Hill, suburbs where in some cases people still have no access to line broadband. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I should say. Good government, responsive and reforming government is not just important, it's necessary. But there is more to be done. And there's a danger, I think, when you come to participate in the work of Parliament, not that you'll be deluded into thinking that we happen to exist at an especially crucial moment in history, but that we might be deluded into, instead into thinking that all the big changes have been won, that what is left is only marginal asymptotic progress along the curve. On any reasonable assessment, that is not the case. There is, in fact, a great deal more to do. Deputy Speaker, the Fremantle electorate is bound up in a number of those challenges, in the need for action on climate change and renewable energy, in the need to hasten the too slow progress to close the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, in relation to the future of work in this country, its forms, quantity and conditions, in regional leadership and our engagement with the wider world, and then in the need for smart and forward-looking urban design and planning, and the delivery of matching transport and communication infrastructure. Granted, city planning sounds boring and technocratic, but unless we get it right, we will consign families in outer metro areas to lives limited by unaffordable housing, dislocated from jobs and services, and characterised by congestion in suburbs where people struggle to feel connected to their neighbours because there's no reason to walk or ride through the streets no local shops or community centres and poor public transport. The local governments in my electorate, Coburn, Fremantle, East Fremantle and Melbourne, are seized by this challenge, but they're frustrated at not being met halfway by state and federal governments. There's no better example right now of that frustration than the Perth Freight Link, and my community is fighting to be on the right side of a decision there that divides between two very different futures. Despite the absence of planning and cost benefit analysis, despite the absence of environmental approval in accordance with the EPA's own policies, the state and federal coalition governments still intend to press ahead with the most expensive road in WA's history, a privately operated toll road that cuts the Belial wetlands in half, locks us out of rail freight and public transport, locks us into greater road congestion and essentially serves to stitch up our public port for private sale. People have been fighting to save those wetlands for 30 years. People like Patrick Hume and Joe Branco and Kate Kelly. Now there are thousands who are fighting for a sensible freight and transport plan, an outer harbour with matching road and rail links that keeps our port in public hands, functions as a much needed major economic catalyst in an area of stubborn unemployment, and above all else, saves the Belial wetlands. Deputy Speaker, 
In Fremantle, the future of work is coming into sharp focus at a point when the number of full-time jobs in Western Australia has fallen for 18 consecutive months, a bleak run that we haven't seen since the last recession in the early 1990s. On the campaign trail, it was notable just how many people talked to me about jobs lost, contracts coming to an end and not being renewed, and when, they were, and when there was work on offer, the fact that it was in similar roles for a lot less money. Employment in resources, manufacturing, construction, maritime work and related trades is under pressure, and jobs across the public service are being cut or squeezed, weakening our social safety net and weakening our capacity in areas like science and research and tax collection. One of the most distinctive things about Fremantle is its loud and proud arts and culture workforce, the ordinary everyday presence and production of musicians, architects, artists, writers, dancers, street performers and even circus performers. <laughs> arts practitioners and businesses are the very definition of the creative economy, and you'd be hard-pressed to find leaner and meaner enterprises or people and organisations that do more with less. So it's incredibly disappointing in my electorate of Fremantle that arts funding and support bodies have been subject to so much chaos in the last couple of years. <laughs> Speaker, Deputy Speaker, for all those reasons, we need to think hard about and plan carefully for the future of work in this country. The technological innovation and disruption that some are calling the second machine age will no doubt offer improvements in productivity, yet aren't by any stretch guaranteed to deliver a smooth transition from older to newer forms of work. We simply can't afford to be complacent or sanguine about the relationship between growth and jobs or innovation and jobs, let alone the relationship between economic growth and rising inequality. The question of work is particularly acute in the context of closing the gap. And this is one area where progress is not merely off track, it's going backwards. As a councillor and deputy mayor in the city of Fremantle, I was very fortunate to work with a united council that made efforts to advance practical and symbolic reconciliation. We established the long-awaited Wallyalup Cultural Centre. We began to address the paucity of Noongar names and signage in our public realm and we introduced a successful 4% Indigenous employment target. I'm very conscious that those achievements are tiny in the scheme of things and that meaningful change needs larger scale program and policy input in areas like social housing, needs-based education, employment support and justice reinvestment. Deputy Speaker, Fremantle is a dynamic and multicultural place, notwithstanding the fact that we have our fair share of dark history. It is outward looking and open with strong links into our region and great potential for those links to become stronger still, especially throughout the Indian Ocean Rim. I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had to see a bit of the world, first as a kid of wandering parents, then under my own steam, including through my work as a writer and photojournalist. Some of the places were a bit more humid than this. I was in Solomon Islands for the 10th anniversary of Ramsey in 2013 with Foreign Minister Bob Carr and with Melissa Park in her role as Minister for International Development. I don't think there are any organic steel-cut oats on that occasion, <laughs> but we did visit an eye clinic where the Fred Hollows Foundation, with the support of Australian Aid, was doing brilliant work, not just giving back sight, but liberating children from the burden of caring for blind parents or relatives and making it possible for them to attend school. I was in Kabul in 2014 as an independent election observer for the audit and recount of the Afghan presidential election, and I shared that work with my friend, the new member for Solomon. It was a reminder of how contingent and fragile democracy can be and a very limited but intense experience of how much damage the Afghan state and its people have endured. Earlier this year, I was in Nagasaki as part of the Mayors for Peace initiative, which saw the installation of the first Australian sculpture in the Nagasaki Peace Park. That sculpture was created by people from Yalatar and Oak Valley in South Australia, <coughs> communities that were forced from their land as a result of the Maralinga bomb tests. And in that sense, the bestowal of the sculpture formed a link between atomic survivor communities. 
The Hibakusha people we met in Nagasaki and Hiroshima joined with the South Australian mob in expressing a clear message. Never again. In this world and in our region, Australia has a role to play in terms of development assistance, in fostering international cooperation and fair trade, and in supporting peace and disarmament. We do live in a time when the greatest challenges, whether it's climate change or resource conflict, resource management or conflict, can only be overcome by nations working together. At the moment, however, there's not a lot to be opt optimistic about on that front. It feels like the prevailing force in the world centrifugal, spinning out towards fragmentation and self-interest rather than towards unity of purpose. <sighs> Deputy Speaker, throughout our history Australia has played a role in leading international cooperation. It's critical that we put our shoulder to that wheel again. But that can't happen if we continue to ransack Australia's overseas development assistance budget, which in addition to reducing poverty and saving lives, if you weren't convinced that reducing poverty and saving lives wasn't good enough, in addition to that, dollar for dollar is one of the best investments we can make in regional security and economic development. Mm -hmm. And that can't happen if we continue to approach our responsibility to asylum seekers by cleaving to the divisive extremes of fear and demonisation or righteousness. The operation of the centres at Nauru and Manus Island has been unacceptable and indefinite detention is wrong. We know that creating a properly constituted regional settlement framework is possible. It's not easy, but it's possible. And we can begin that work by engaging with the UNHCR and our regional neighbours, by increasing our humanitarian intake, and by finding resettlement places for people currently held in detention as a matter of urgency. It can't be said better uh, than my colleague and most often neighbour here, the member for Wills earlier today, and I thank him for putting it so well. Deputy Speaker, those are some of the areas in which I hope to make a, a contribution in this place, recognising that in many cases I will join others in a collective effort, supporting progress in the wider cause rather than looking for a place on the grandstand. And speaking of grandstand, Deputy Speaker, I'm grateful to have some people here with me today that form part of my extended tribe. My mum, Poonam, and my sister, Guy, my aunt and uncle, Elizabeth and Mark Ahrens, long-time family friend and wise woman, Joan Sheridan, one of my oldest and best mates, John Hill, and above all, my wife, Georgia, and my children, Oscar, Priya, and Abby. I know that my dad, GR, my brother, Mo, and other family and friends will be watching and listening elsewhere. Deputy Speaker, none of us here is a lone ranger, and to be honest, that's a mercy. Even at this early stage, I know it would be impossible for anyone to put their heart and soul and sweat, as it turns out, <laughs> into their representative work without the love and support and honesty and good-natured ribbing that only family and friends can provide. Uh, my dad has a pretty fair sense of right and wrong. Uh, he and I are maybe too similar in that way. Uh, but I love him, and for years he gave his time to the good governance of, of not-for-profit cultural organisations driven by his love of music and the arts, and I'm glad I, I got a bit of that too. My mum, who's here today, is the most optimistic and accepting and resourceful adventurer that I've ever known. When I was growing up, I didn't always appreciate some of the, the feats of loving parenthood that she managed to pull off in extraordinary circumstances and sometimes and sometimes I was guilty of being a, self-conscious about the way we lived, the fact that we, we moved a lot. We pulled together interesting meals, we lived in strange countries, and even that, uh, that she cut our hair. <laughs> As I've got older, 
with a much better appreciation of, of that strength of self and that unconditional love, I've really come to marvel at my mum's energy, positivity and generosity of spirit. I wish I had more of it. <clears throat> and thanks for the haircut. <laughs> All right. Uh, Deputy Speaker, my brother and sister and I have shared a lot. My brother's not, not here today, but my sister is. And as kids, we lived with mum in a bamboo hut in India. We were the Australian oddities at school in Long Island, New York. And we came to mostly amicable bedroom sharing arrangements in probably 15 different rental houses on the limestone bridges and in the valleys of Fremantle. I'm grateful we all live there close by still. Uh, and last but most of all, the beating heart of my world is my own family, my wife Georgia, and, and our children, Oscar, Priya and Abby. I love you. On the theme of acknowledgement, Speaker, and with fewer tears, I want to thank those who travelled the road of the Fremantle campaign with me. Campaigns are not just a means to an end. Campaigns have value in themselves. They're the way we come together and pursue something bigger than our individual interests. I want to thank the WA Labor Party and the Labor movement in the West for their huge practical and moral support. I pay tribute to the organisational and morale lifting work of the WA Labor team, led by Patrick Gorman and Linda O'Shalem, often mentioned in dispatches today, and carried forward by hundreds of valiant people within Labor's Community Action Network. I thank local state Labor members Fran Logan, Peter Tinley and especially my fellow member for Fremantle, the state member for Fremantle, Simone McGurk. For my own sake, I have to particularly acknowledge the fantastic support of the rank and file Fremantle electorate branch members and my campaign team, especially David Settlemeyer, Matt Bowden, Leanne Willows, Kath Longley, Nick Chinner and the four Peters, Peter White, Peter Feezy, Peter Woodward and Peter Tagliaferri, who is also here today. And I do want to mention the two small left unions that roared, Sue Bowers and the Commonwealth and Public Sector Union, Sue's here today, and John Welch of the Western Australian Prisoners Office Union. Thank you both for standing up when it appeared there wasn't much hope or much point. So to bring my first slightly damp first speech in this incredible place to an end, Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to say that I am a romantic. That won't make sense to people reading in the future. <laughs> I'm happy to say that I am a romantic when it comes to representative democracy. I think it's one of the best things. I don't agree with Winston Churchill. I think it's one of the best things. It deserves to be valued. It deserves to be performed with maximum effort and cultivated with great care, with its essence and structure respected and its live parts allowed to flourish and be renewed. As a new member in this place, I intend to listen and learn, to not hold back for fear of making the odd mistake or the odd joke, to participate and work hard in good spirit and good faith to make a difference, and always to apply myself in dedicated service to the people of Fremantle.